Hey everyone, welcome to the Mind and Muscle HQ. Um, today we have a special episode with a special guest, Martin Fenn. Welcome, Martin. Say hello, Thanks, Martin. Jamie. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, and today's episode is going to be based around um, uh, my four-week experiment in which Martin coached, which was basically a rapid fat loss phase, if you want to call it that, where we also prioritised the health aspect with, um, as most of you probably know, is I have a lot of health issues and we basically prioritise those too. But before we get into that, we're going to introduce everyone again and go through our weeks and what we've done this week. So let's start with you, Matt. What have you done this week? Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining um, so this week, I suppose, um, mainly um, at, at the weekend, I did attend a bodybuilding show and had a client in there um, who'd done okay, you know, he'd done not too bad. He won his class and then won the overall, so uh, we were very, very proud. There was a good showing from him. Um, and then I've just been really working on um, some new programming sheets for my clients um, and putting all the data into that, adding new exercises and foods. Um, completely revamped um, so yeah that's taken up most of my time and I have had an influx of new clients as well so they're all, it's all keeping me very very busy nice. over to you Tyler yeah hi everyone so my week this week is a bit different in terms of I haven't got my bodybuilding training to do I'm on a complete rest period which means no no training for me this week over the last four or five days last week my strength was coming down I felt my energy levels dropping so it's at that point where you, you just listen to your body and actually I've had a really good stretch of you know 12 weeks of really consistent good training and um, so I've got this full week of um, rest week so no weight training and I've really just been concentrating on a new program that I've launched which is the Alpha Life and getting the, the clients signed up and getting the programming done. So nice and busy um, with work. So it's quite nice to push more energy into that through my, my rest week, which I'm enjoying. Tyler, just tell us a little bit about that, that new program then. What, what is it? What does it mean? What is, what's it involved? Yeah, so Alpha Life, it's, it's basically so that I can help people reach the potential by creating an unstoppable mindset um, and developing a, a physique what they can be proud of stand tall in be confident in and actually a physique that they ne never actually thought was possible um and i use a few different techniques which i go through throughout the process through three different stages of evolution i've called it um, and it's so that you can be the best person um and the best version of you so i'm actually really looking forward to getting my first test group through the process um so yeah that's really exciting sounds awesome sounds epic right um i'll quickly do mine and obviously i'll let martin introduce himself after um so for me it's just been basically me and excel have a really strong relationship so um my as i advertised it the other day again so i finished my food list it took two weeks, five hours a day, and I finished my own version of my fitness pal. It's I'm very, very proud of it. So no one insult Excel. Um, and that is one of many upgrades um, that I announced the other day as well. So I'm looking to rebuild a lot of structures to my coaching service, as well as um, just like Matt said as well, just improving software as well. So improving my health screening, improving blood work, just trying to merge it all together. So mine was more just improving that aspect and sitting at the laptop on excel and getting 2000 steps a day which was great um but yeah that's pretty much me in a nutshell um how about how about you martin well so introduce yourself martin and what have you done this week so i'm martin um run mf performance coaching so i'm jamie's coach we know each other from the carter institute um so similar to tyler actually i've actually been on a deload for the last week so it's really just been studying going more into the functional medicine and biomechanics fields and um that that along with just moving house has pretty much taken up all of my time <laughs> and i noticed they're moving houses at the bottom of the list there, but... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well it, it's been we moved in like what, a couple of weeks ago now so it's just been like the finalizing of everything so now it's just Organized. you know got got through the major stresses Hence the deload now, just to let everything calm down a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, before um, we get into um, the discussion, Mon, uh, I just want to tell the the uh, listeners that we all obviously join in and have a little private offline chat before we join. And uh, the listeners do know about some of the 
my health problems and one of those is around the sleep apnea and I, I just want to say that I'm blown away already just by a, a literally a two minute conversation um, which you, you know at the moment going down the NHS route I'm scheduled or, or potentially scheduled to have surgery to to um, correct the problem and Martin um, in two minutes has, has already um, helped um, probably identify some some key issues that, that could be um, rectified uh, without any surgery so it's, it's absolutely blown my mind and um, I'm going to be speaking with Martin outside of this conversation and, and having a consultation with him and trying to look at those issues um, to, to, to fix them going forward so that's really exciting news from me mm -hmm. um, and Jamie do you want to talk about the Carter Institute uh, with which Martin's involved do you want to uh, have a little absolutely. discussion around that? Yeah, so, um, well, I reached out to the Car Institute because um, before I started even looking at blood, so I've been at the Car Institute now, I think, since March, um, and I was always looking into gut health, but it was all personal experience. Like, I could help people avoid and identify foods, like, say, gluten was an issue with some people, and those things are real people. If someone tells you they're not, they're talking shit. Um, and I never knew why. So I, couldn't ever, I could never find out why. Like, why was FODMAPs an issue? Why is gluten and dairy an issue? Why were histamine foods such a issue right and i always say right i'm bored of helping people run from foods i want to start fixing people and actually helping people get to the root cause right and long story short i had a business mentor at the time who's steve mcgrath he's a legend i really like steve um and we were talking about it and he believed that was the one thing holding me back as a coach he was like you're what you do is fine you just need to have confidence in yourself and that was what i found was my weak spot he then was best friends with jake back in manchester because jake's from manchester and he now lives in australia and i just reached out and Jake, in all honesty, was the very first person I've ever spoke to on a call as a mentor that I genuinely got on with. And it wasn't forced. Like we genuinely got on well, we're both from England, obviously, we both swear and stuff like that. And it was nice to have a comfortable conversation with someone, especially when I was like, like you, when you were speaking to Martin earlier. I had the same like wow moment with Jake. So I literally just spoke about stuff with him. And he pretty much said, have you got mold issues, by the way? And he literally from talking to me. And it was like, but like, now you're not my best friend now. Um, so we were talking like that. And then we just, I got, I started the Institute. I was absolutely catching myself because um, like the stuff Martin knows, like everyone in there has their, like their own expertise. Like you've got what, Brendan. What is, what is the Institute? What is it? Tell, just tell us briefly around, you know, the top, top line. What, what is the Institute? What does it do? Um, it's based. Who, who can do it? Who can attend it? How do you do it? All, all this kind of information. Well, it's basically a 12 months course with Jake, who's at the head of it. Um, and obviously, Brendan is head coach as well. And the idea of it is it, it helps coaches or even individuals, if you're keen, understand the functional side of things. And what functional medicine is, it's, a, it's away from conventional. So like normal ranges on blood work or being told that you're fine when you're clearly bloody not, which happens to a lot of people. Um, and it just helps educate you on the bits that people don't talk about. Like, I think Jake has, what, 28 modules? Like, it's a 12 month course, right? it's 28 modules the very first one covers calories and the basics after that it then goes into like mineral content blood work um, hormones the female cycle every area you can think of that genuinely affects your overall health performance and obviously body composition is covered and the idea of it is every friday you have catch-up calls where you talk to everyone in the group and i'm quite a in-house person i don't like talking in groups this is the first group I are genuinely talking. Like I've never spoken groups before. I've always, like, as you guys know, when you first met me, I'm very in-house. And it's honestly, to be in a group of people where everyone's got their own expertise and they all have their own thing and everyone's got their own beliefs. Not all of them are coaches. Some of them are functional practitioners. Some of them, are, I think some of them are studying to be doctors. Like everyone's different, you know? Um, have I explained that right, Martin? Have you got any thoughts on how it works? <laughs> no, you've pretty much nailed that. So it's, yeah, like I said, it's a 12-month course covering all of the realms of functional medicine, looking at the human body as a combination of systems and how those systems interact to drive the overall health of a person, rather than looking at things as a mass of symptoms and then addressing symptoms. Yeah, find the root cause, basically. Like, I'm not being funny, we're about to touch on half my health issues. Um, that, yeah, so let's just say, since I've been in the Carter Institute, We've pretty much uh, rectified and diagnosed three health issues that I was not even aware of. I thought it was just mold. 
and it's really not. So it, it's just amazing. And also, we've even possibly found a reason as to why I'm so sensitive to mold, which we discussed off air as well. So there's this, and I can genuinely tell you as a coach that loves the health aspect, being in this institute since March, I cannot speak highly, more highly of it. And I genuinely, it's made me five times as more confident as a coach. Like as we know at the Fit Expo, I'm not a doctor, but reading bloods. If you told me four months ago that I was going to be reading bloods like that, I'd have gone, fuck off, that's going to take me years. Four months in, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of Zoom video watching and studying, but now it's just me and my Excel sheets, A, a mine, have really, really pulled through. Um, so, yeah. I have a lot of spreadsheets. Yeah, if like if I can genuinely say, if you're a coach that cares about health, I could not, this is the best course I've ever done. But I've done, I've done loads of different courses, but this is the one I felt connected me better to what I believe in as a coach the most. And it doesn't actually forget the, it's not all like, oh, blood work, health this. There's also the physical aspect. He still goes through calories, still goes through read feeds. Like there's still that aspect to it. But so we I'm, all know. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. So, I was just going to say, we can, we can add all the links. We can add Martin's obviously um, links and, and the, um, the, um, um, institutes links etc uh, uh, when we share this podcast so anyone that's interested in in finding out inf- more information they can approach um, the Carter Institute or, or Martin as well if they want to speak to Martin directly well Jake's handle is at coach Jake Carter um, and like I said he's he's the he's the forefront of it Jake Carter is the legend yeah. that, we'll, that we'll, we'll add it into the text of the um, yeah yeah post. description yeah yeah. um so yeah that's that's the Carter Institute as a whole um do you want me to start the full week experiment should we start that yeah so so obviously not everyone's listened I would imagine to previous um podcasts so um just open up Jamie by just a very brief if you can um <laughs> <laughs> shut up my <Martin. laughs> summarize what, the, right. you know the, the four weeks leading up to this and, and then we can get into the, the meat of the topic okay um so i'm going to time myself so in a nutshell but what well there's so much more to a, a transformation than just calories right and i kind of wanted to prove that so long story short i'm going to keep it short i we had twins and my wife's pregnancy was incredibly stressful i won't go into that because that's a very emotional trauma in itself um and i basically let go of everything i went full dad bod i gained about i would say about eight kilos funny enough um eight kilos quite quickly it was a kind of watery puffball uh, even training went down a bit because of covid and back and forth and stuff like that and lockdown and um and i basically w- w- had a thing where i started to realize i wasn't representing i wasn't being a role model to my clients so i was like right i need to sort this out and i knew that virtually all the weight gain because i wasn't being a child was just water and inflammation i'm incredibly sensitive to foods environmental toxins literally and if, you, if i went near a car and it puffed up enough petrol i'll probably react it's that bad um so i just thought right i just got to sort this out and obviously i was in the institute every week since march at that point um and and i always spoke with martin me and martin pretty much clicked very quickly and obviously he's from england as well which helps and um and yeah we, we clicked very quickly and i just reached out to martin because i was studying the lymphatic system and i think we did one trial on it just like one of martin's videos i just did one trial and the reaction i got was so potent i was like well this clearly shows that this is an issue right and mold can affect the lymphatic system which i have um signs of overgrowth with and yeah and i just basically had this mindset where i wanted to do almost an experiment on myself to prove how much your health your food choices your your mineral absorption all these things matter your drainage pathways how much these things affect how you look feel and function so a lot of my issues were water-based they had nothing to do with calories right so i just wanted to do a very very strong experiment and with the knowledge i've already had from years of dealing with health issues combined with a new approach from lymphatic work plus a health protocol after having my bloods run with martin and jake and obviously analyze it myself too so every, in my in my own belief, that is every area. So someone said to me they wanted to do a diet and we have blood work, lymphatic pathways open, and obviously the physical aspect through calories and macros. I genuinely believe if you nail that, you are going to look ridiculous and you're going to get where you want to be very quickly if there is issues there, right? So we just wanted to prove a point, basically. And in a nutshell, it took four weeks, one day, I think it was, and we dropped eight and a half kilos. And I just want to clarify at that midpoint of that, three weeks in, I actually got ill. And I actually reacted to foods randomly because I got ill. And we also diagnosed another health issue after the thing, which I wish we knew at the start. Um, So we should have actually dropped around 10, probably even more if it went really well. 
kilos in four weeks. And that just shows how quickly that was coming off of me. And calories did not change. We were at 40% percent deficit. They, they changed once. We put them up in the middle. Sorry, you know, they increased. Yeah, my bad. Um, so I didn't respond. My body was responding very well to a low carb diet like, um, setting. But because of stress load where I got ill, we actually wanted to take the stress off the body a bit by increasing carb load. So just to give it a bit more. So we pulled fats down a little bit, but we mainly increased carbs. Um, and that it worked to some extent, but where I was ill, it just didn't help. So I got ill very poorly, basically. Like very, and it was nothing to do with Rona people, just to clarify that. And, um, and yeah, but other than that, throughout the four weeks, strength built. <laughs> the biggest thing that I found really funny was, by the way, this is a very quick description. Have you noticed how quick I'm doing this? Um, <laughs> uh, the, we actually reduced my volume. And this is what blows my mind when people start dieting, that they increase volume. They start causing more damage. We, oh, what do you mean? You mean for, for, I'll put volume, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. well, basically, Martin looked at my physique and was very, very, very sensitive when he turned around and said, you've got really fat. You should be embarrassed of yourself. I was like, thanks, Martin. Cheers, mate. Um, and <laughs> I didn't and, say it exactly like that, did I? All right, that's just how I heard it, obviously. <laughs> Paraphrasing. He should have said, Jamie, you're so lean. You should just carry on building. That's what you should have said. And, um, <laughs> and yeah, so basically, we were like, right, you've got excessive levels of inflammation. So that means the body is struggling to deal with that load or it wouldn't be on the outside, let alone on the inside, right? Your body's struggling to deal with this load. So you go and then do three sets of eight to 12, the intensity that I like to push myself to because everyone's different. That's just going to create more muscle trauma, more inflammation, more. That's why you, why, you tip, why you filling up a bucket that's already full. So we pulled the volume right back to the point where I was not happy. Not going to lie. I was pissed. One set on a hat squat and I was like, this is, I want to do another one and I wasn't allowed to. And um, I think in the first week we actually dropped the math, the four and a half kilos was down in the first week. So that was the no, three, three and a half, sorry, was down in the first week. And that was purely from that change alone. Um, and then working through that. Um, okay. okay. So just to summarize, let me see if I've got this, if I try to summarize for the, for the viewers, what you, you wanted the desired outcome of, um, composition change so you wanted to look better yep. um ultimately water loss a bit of fat loss um you had a four week period or you set yourself a four week period to achieve that outcome mm -hmm. um rather than just a calorie controlled diet um with the experience and knowledge that you've learned um via martin and, and the coaching from martin you added in um on top of just basic calorie cutting and um, output, uh, you added in lymphatic um, treatment or, or drainage, what? daily, daily Drain, drainage. Yeah, drainage. Um, you checked your blood prior. Mm -hmm. Okay, and was there anything else that uh, additionally that you that you? Was there any cardio that you were doing, Jamie, with that as well, or was it just straight through weight training? Uh, well, like I said, we we started it with bloods, um, bloods. Uh, assessing lymphatic flow with Martin. We also did some neurological work, which I won't go into because that's way, uh, way out there. Um, <laughs> uh, we did that. So we started, we had that start point, but then we actually wanted to prove that it's, so what we wanted to kind of put out of this was you don't have to die during a prep in summer scenarios. Like you see, I'm not being funny, right? And I'm sorry if this offends anyone, but it does get on my skin. You've got coaches that have like bikini athletes that are doing 900 calories. I'm not sorry if this actually offends you because that means your coach is terrible. 900 calories a day, an hour's cardio a day, training six days a week. For a bikini athlete, which realistically isn't that hard and dry, what the hell is going on? So there's, a, there's basically a health handbrake that's causing those issues, right? So what I didn't want to do, and I said this to mine, was go into that, right? Let's do an hour's cardio a day. Let's do, it's actually make it quite easy on the body. From this, this almost just help the body shift it. So we did a cardio once a week. Once a week cardio, I have a sauna upstairs, which is a little tent one where I have my head out and I look very attractive. I blew up blocking glasses on at night and I play some Fortnite because I'm a massive grown up. Um, so it's half an hour. So I do a, I did a lymphatic drainage every night. So the lymphatic system, which I'll let Martin go into in a minute, but in a nutshell is your waste clearing system. If that's blocked up, toxins can't come out of you efficiently. So if you open up that pathway, you're almost opening the gate for inflammation, toxin, even fat to some extent, because fat is a toxin to be allowed out of you. So you do all this work, pulling it out yourself, being in a deficit. But if you can't go anywhere, where's it going to go, right? So, so what, what I'm hearing then is, is basically um, there's lots of different Parts. ways to, to achieve the outcome. If mm -hmm. we only ever select calories and output, 
um, then we're missing a trick effectively and health. Um, uh, we're not looking at people's health or concerned um, by incorporating lymphatic drainage, addressing or looking at bloods and identifying any underlying issues prior to that. So just focusing on, on calories alone and output is, is a little bit um, naive or... Yeah, I have plenty of case studies where my clients have been in a maintenance or even slightly higher and they've dropped crap loads of water. Like water retention and inflammation does not directly get affected by calorie intake. If you're, let's say you're in a maintenance phase and you were digesting everything fine, it's causing no issues and you were inflamed to some extent or holding water, you would get leaner. And it's okay. not, but that's, that's not a fat loss response. That's what okay. we have to make clear. So should we go over to Martin and then from Martin to kind of... Um, to tell us where you started with this and um, um, how you looked at it and where you went went with how how did you select this this kind of process? Well, after analysing me, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sweet. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So basically, we analysed Jamie just from a holistic perspective. So looking at every system rather than just addressing one cause. So we looked at how his body was storing fat or storing inflammation as well addressed it from a questionnaire so I could get a bit of depth into his history. So history on hormones, on his thyroid, on like sleep, lifestyle, stresses, gut health, just to see where the, the overall balance of overall stress was because stress is an all encompassing term. It's not just that which we perceive as stressful stress on the nervous system could be perceived as anything in life. So a hormonal imbalance, a gut health imbalance, a psychological conflict, emotional behaviors, anything like that could be construed as stress. Tattoo. Now, tattoo, yeah. So any, yeah. <laughs> anything like that is a stress. Um, and we have to manage the overall stresses on the system and find a level that Jamie's body at that moment in time could handle and then alongside that we looked at the detoxification pathways so those are the the lungs the lymphatic system the kidneys how often he pees how often he poos and just to make sure that all of these systems are pulling their weight and otherwise we will typically find one is overburdened and often in most people, that will be the skin. So when we see most people, a lot of people now will have various skin issues. And I don't view that as a skin issue. I view that as a symptom. So it's symptomatic of something else going on, an overburdened detoxification system, whether that's the lungs, liver, kidneys, colon, lymphatics. Pretty much everyone alive today, whether they're aware of it or not, will have a lymphatic issue just because of how the modern world is situated, how everything around us isn't optional, isn't um, optimal for health and for stimulating these drainage pathways with the toxins in food, toxins in water, toxins in the air and so on. Even movement so, patterns. Yeah, so this is one of the things we delved into with Jamie as well. So we looked at how he moved being a bodybuilder, typically always the same set patterns on machines, going through the exact same mid-range stimulus on every movement. And we can drive mechanical deformation of these lymphatic vessels in that way. So part of it for Jamie, which he just loved doing, was... Um, like he hated it. I'm not even going <laughs> to say that. <laughs> was, was getting him moving in different ways so we could reduce the mechanical tension on these circulatory vessels. So we could start to get blood flow, start to get lymphatic flow, start to get neural impulses and venous return. So um, just, to, just, to clarify, just to clarify that, because yeah, so basically Martin, rather than me having a hat squat, I had to do, or a leg extension, I have to do exercises that I can't stand, like a freaking rear foot elevated split squat, loaded just on one side. Like things that make your body balance and work to a structure more efficiently, basically. Yeah, Why so that that, help. What, what, what's the reason for going into the lymphatic, lymphatic system? Like what would be the reason or... Um, like the effects of that not being right, what effect would that have on someone and why would you then choose to target that? 
so it's a key player in disease. So the, the two of them, well, the, one of the main aspects of disease will be inflammation. Two of the main areas that will drive the body towards inflammation are deficiency and toxicity. Mm -hmm. So the lymphatics are majorly involved in reducing the toxic burden on the body. And alongside that, it's also whenever we see a lymphatic vessel, it's going to have a corresponding vein, artery and nerve. So if we've got issues in the lymphatic system, we'll have restrictions in those areas. And it's likely we're going to have reduced blood flow and reduced neural impulses. So then looking at that from the bodybuilding perspective, reduced blood flow, we're not going to be able to get an effective pump. And having reduced neurological input, we're not going to be able to sustain an effective contraction. So our overall strength is going to be limited. So we can often see this like immediately on introducing a lymphatic treatment. If you take some like basic range of movement assessments beforehand, or some easy like grip strength um, assessments, just as a basic marker of strength, and then drive the um, lymphatics, uh, we can see how it stimulates different nerve endings and mm -hmm. will drive um, a relaxation of impulse, increase the sensory information that goes up to the brain, also um, improving control of the area that we're trying to work. So if I do some like lymphatic release around the back of the knee, we're likely going to improve the stimulus around the calf. And because of all of these different receptors that we can stimulate with different frequencies of touch, we can drive all of these different neural impulses that relax the system, give it more sensory information, and then also more motor information. Because any it, anywhere within our system, people generally only focus on the mechanical stimulus so that motor information, which is what's coming down from the brain, but the actual mechanical aspect of our nerves, of our sensory nerves only makes up 20%. The other 80% are like interoceptive. So they, they, talk, they send impulses based on the internal state of the body. So if we're not looking after that internal state of the body, that's 80% of the of the relay to the brain that we're not, we're not taking into account. So how can we have a fully effective system if we're only addressing 20%? So yeah. this starts to get towards that other 80% of all of that internal information. Hey, this way, oh, sorry, go on, Matt, go on. I'm just gonna say, obviously for people listening, um, and us. <laughs> I mean, people, anybody listening is going to be going, wow, I want some lymphatic treatment. So, so are there practitioners that you could go to and just rock up and go, sort me out, you know, you know, is it because the, the listeners want something really, really simple. Are they able to go to a practitioner and say, I need some kind of lymphatic drainage? I need they, to look at they don't even need to go to a practitioner. Um, well, it's something, you can, so, we do it ourselves. something yeah. you can do yourself really easily. Um, I've got a few on my Instagram. I will re-upload them so they're fresh as well. Um, so the basic level of treatment and everything you're looking for in terms of like what to expect, any contraindications, I'll upload that later today, actually. So they're, so it's sort of pinned to the um, IGTV so you can see exactly how to do the most base level treatment, what to expect, when not to do it, how frequently you can do it. And yeah, basically it's a really easy process. All you need is like a toothbrush in your hands. The one thing I want to say though, before, before this is I get so, so with my clients, I've started. Um, so obviously since working with Martin, so I hired Martin as a mentor and watched some of Dr. Perry Nichols and stuff as well. who is like the guy that, he is like the guy that does lymphatic work stop chasing pain by the way so i would definitely recommend everyone follows him um and i think you spent one to one with him didn't you Martin? where you like it as well so um, i i did a cup i did a two-day course with perry and then another one day course and then some other work online as well yeah um, so i've done a few courses with perry and here's where i've got a lot of my lymphatic resources from also alongside um amn academy which is applied movement neurology. So that's the area that Jamie said he wouldn't dive into too much. Um, yes. So my background is in functional neurology. 
So looking at the body in an organized system of importance from a neurological aspect and how we can basically drive the majority of responses in physical tissue from changing things on a neural level. So looking at thought, feeling, emotion, memories first, as they can change the representation of physical structures. And this is some of the stuff we dived into with Jamie over the four week, um, four week experiment. So without going into too much detail, a lot of Jamie's mold issues stem from a specific emotionally charged event in his past, which I didn't know based off assessment. He I, guessed my childhood, people. He guessed my childhood, put it that way. And I did not yeah. tell him. I did not tell him. <laughs> so uh, these emotionally charged events basically store two separate but coinciding memories. The implicit, which are the subconsciously stored, and the explicit, which are our consciously stored memories. So we have these conscious memories, which obviously is our perception of the event. And then we have this underlying subconscious memory as well. And it's these which so often re uh, lie under the surface and just sort of bubble away in the background. But then whenever the, whenever the nervous system is under threat, they come to the surface and drive a behavioral response and it's these feelings, thoughts, memories, which drive emotional behavior and can drive um, hormonal responses and actual physiological changes. So, so this, this area sounds like it's sitting in this, um, like a psychological type um, area, but, but overlapping in, into health. Um, am, I, am I right? Yeah. I've, uh... I've got to be really careful because I am not a psychologist. I am not a neurologist. I'm not a doctor. Everything we're saying here, by the way, people, is just our opinion. We This is a disclaimer. We are not <laughs> doctors. We're just talking out of our ass because we like the subjects of health. This shows the importance, actually, of, of what's going on emotionally, not just physically, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah, so... Well, our, our first release, I yawn, I was saying earlier, our first proper release, I yawn for about... My said, if you yawn once, that's your, almost your brain letting go. And like releasing emotion I, I yawned what for a minute i could not stop literally martin was talking to me and i looked like i was crying so i was yawning so much and yeah and i went upstairs to my wife and she was talking to me i kept yawning I was like, i'm not bored i'm freaking emotional <laughs> so yeah the, energy coming out isn't it yeah, yeah right so it, it's basically where like i said i'm not a neurologist i'm not a doctor i look at the nervous system and how it presents and then based off how the nervous system is presenting, I give it a series of specific impulses and inputs. So for Jamie, it correlated around a region of the brain, which coincides with mold and around his small intestine, which correlates with anger. And then we, we timelined that back to a specific year in his childhood. You know, I'd actually yeah. mind sharing this because there's people out there that have gone through it. So just so people, just so people get a rough idea of how powerful this stuff can be. My father um, is a very nasty man. Uh, no, he, he basically had loads of affairs and left my mum when I was two. And I was, and then my stepdad did something similar. And then I was basically left at a very young age to raise all the women in my family by myself. So that's what that comes from. So if anyone out there can relate to that, I'm telling you now to look into your emotions because these things will play very strong roles. And again, how society is today, there's probably loads of kids out there that have angry dad symptoms because of this, right? Um, so yeah, so I'm more than happy to share that. It was based around feeling hopeless and feeling like you have to prove yourself and feeling like you're never good enough. It was emotions based around those responses. I don't mind sharing that. So, yeah. And then, yeah, and then based off how those present in this subconscious layer of the brain, it can drive a specific pathogenic response. And the, the layer of the brain that this correlates to is mold specific. P going into why Jamie is more susceptible to mold because he already has this preferential area of his brain which drives mold exposure. Well, sorry, drives mold production as a way of detoxifying from the stimulus of the emotion. So anything that's in our body could be viewed as toxic. The emotions, feelings, thoughts, even our relationships, our uh, environment, and the body will induce a specific response to detox from that stimulus. So in Jamie's case, it was that thought pattern, that um, subconscious layer of thought. 
And because of the layer of the brain that this was involved at, the response was mold or mycobacterial. So once we address the nervous system from that aspect, um, it's basically looking at his nervous system and then putting that stimulus in to reduce the stressor. So it basically just lowers the tone of his nervous system going from a stress response, so fight or flight, and into a rest and digest system, so parasympathetic. Once we go parasympathetic, we start to digest better. Uh, as Jamie said, he yawned loads. So that's a real sign that he's starting to switch to more of this like lower, lower stress rest and digest system, which most people in today's world aren't very good at accessing. So I'm conscious that we're, we're Going down a rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 yeah. no, no. So this is really, really good stuff. All right. And we're, we're going into great detail. Um, but uh, the original kind of question that you were trying to answer was, how, <laughs> where did you, how, how did you, um, you analysed Jamie, um, and that, that was part of the anal analysis that you talk about there. I'm just trying to um, get Keep people on track. back on, on, get the people's listeners back on track, because I would imagine listening to that, they're probably going, well, this isn't going to help me it sounds way too far or I've, i won't be able to get martin to help me or, or whatever um it, it is relatively simple in the sense of what what you, i mean it's obviously complicated um but i want to try and make it more sounds understandable simple, yeah. and simple for the listeners so the lymphatic techniques are simply applied through just like rubbing brushing tapping scraping on certain areas of the body that are, are densely populated in lymphatic vessels. And we wanna be always pushing those towards the collarbones. So that's the main area of drainage. So we apply the system in a specific sequence because it coincides with the way the lymphatic vessels are actually formed and the way they drain. So if so you look for a lymphatic massage people and they don't start at the collarbone and they're putting more pressure than holding a pound coin against the wall. They don't know what them, they're doing. Yeah, tell them to stop because they're actually like a really aggressive massage actually caused me to retain water about a year ago. And I didn't know why back then, but now I know because it closes the valves and they almost backflow and it's a one way system. So be very careful if you go and get a massage now and the guy or the lady starts brushing your calf first because that's very basic information that they're not, they've not studied on. Sorry to cut you up, mine. I just wanted to make that clear. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. And then from, from the neurological aspect, it's a very complex system that's very easily applied. If you have someone who knows what they're doing, so if, if that's the sort of treatment you think might be beneficial, uh, you can like drop me a message on um, Instagram or through my website to book a consultation or go through applied movement neurology because there's there's a fair few of us that go into this neurological realm of treatment. Um, and then looking at the other assessments, as I said, it was a questionnaire, so we could get Jamie's history to look at his immune system, look at his lifestyle, and address any of these areas that blood work won't pick up on, because the blood work is just a snapshot in time that gives you data at that moment in time, rather than a whole history of how he's got there. So then it's with, with that information, we were able to set up his nutrition to give him specific foods that are beneficial for um, histamine and mast cell uh, activation syndrome. So implementing specific foods that give him high doses of compounds like quercetin, which help to um, lower histamine and just other um, areas, like we said about his movement patterns, looking at how his movement patterns could increase the inflammation because they'll reduce the drainage capacity of the lymphatic system. So basically looking at areas, well, looking at movements that he always does, looking at areas that he can't move <laughs> very well into and setting up specific exercise selection so that he learns how to utilize his breathing muscles and change the shape of his pelvis. Well, sorry, not change the shape, because we can't change the shape, but to change how it orients itself so that he can access all of the available ranges rather than just being stuck in one pattern. 
basically so, knee coming up and pressing like a hat spot or a leg press people that's basically what we're saying yeah basically so, my, my gym is caked in cybex which is an amazing manufacturer and martin's exact words were you've been sport for machines for a, a few years now so you've got stuck in those patterns of machines so martin made me do free weight stuff that i freaking hate doing like a bent over medals row that's a very good example um <laughs> so yeah <laughs> pretty much that's what he needs so yeah it, it's looking at areas that jamie couldn't move into and obviously this is going to create restrictions in tissue which will then restrict how everything's functioning below it on a deeper level so looking at this most simply if you look into your like general compensation patterns so look at where you're tight like generally are going to be around the chest around the groin um upper abdominals these are all some of the areas of most densely populated lymph and a lot of my uh, tightness was from lymph remember when we first did it i've always had a left shoulder issue where it's impinged years ago um i started draining lymphatics and just so you know people first time i did a lymphatic drain i had a massive histamine rash across you can't see me people listening to it but from my right i just realized i'm showing it that's it <laughs> so my, showing what you're doing it. yeah i know i'm still doing it as well people i'm doing like hand puppets so my right thumb i'm still showing just in case we have might youtube it my right thumb all the way across from my elbow to my shoulder to my my right pet had a massive rash and it caused really bad headaches as well that's the first time i ever did a lymph rush and i was like oh this stuff matters um and then after doing that i we did a, we did the more advanced one because i stopped having reactions from the basic and all my shoulder pain to this day has gone as well as the heel pain i used to get if i ever went for a run that has also disappeared so that shows how much tight tissue is related to lymphatics I just want to say on that point that what Jamie had there was a detoxification reaction. And it hurts. We're, yeah, so we're, we're not chasing a detox reaction. Um, we want to grade the exposure into the system to minimise discomfort. Jamie being Jamie, obviously. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing this right. <laughs> did things slightly more aggressively than I told him from time to time. And uh, as... But we have four that, weeks, man. We have four weeks. <laughs> that, but that detoxification reaction did subside pretty quickly, and we yeah. just we just made sure that that we monitored the detox reaction and that he didn't do another treatment until it had subsided. It didn't last long. It was gone pretty quickly. An hour. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say as well, the first time I did lymphatic treatments was a week after I'd competed. So obviously my body was pretty trashed. And I had two days worth of courses on it. And rather than tiptoeing into the system, I basically was a guinea pig and I threw up. Oh, I had, so I had that happen to one of my clients. She, uh, she didn't throw up, but she gagged quite a few times. It was almost where it was emptying. Yeah, yeah. Because, Why would that happen? Because I had a 12-week prep. Uh, the two weeks prior to that, I was actually in hospital on an IV drip. Um, so there was a lot of shit going on in my body. Yeah. Um, and just the overall stress, years of having gut issues and um, the overall stress. And then they went over my entire body twice. And also we did some organ manipulation and moved my liver, moved my spleen, uh, manipulated my intestines a little bit. And it was just too much for the system to handle. So he just slagged me off for going too far, too fast, people. It took me four weeks to do what he just told to do. So he'd done it on the first day. So... Yeah, hypocrite much. <laughs> I suppose you should have listened to him. Wait, well, I didn't go, I didn't start massaging my liver. I just brushed with a dry brush. <laughs> so I, I will say this was because I was on a course and I was one of the models and like guinea pigs for it. Um, and then while we were exploring the treatments, obviously I had a major reaction because of the previous 14 weeks. This is why, like, this is one of the main reasons why we do always like tiptoe into the system, really treat it like we would any progressive overload. So you're not going to go into the gym for the first day and put four plates on a squat. So we treat it as a progressive overload system like we would with anything else where we start low when we can safely progress the system we do. So we started low with Jamie. Then we started to introduce more areas um, around the face, around the neck, because that's a densely populated site. Then we started to go more in depth around the rest of the body, introducing like all of the lymphatic points around the rest of the body. And when he could really safely tolerate that, 
we started looking at moving his organs slightly. So it's do in, uh, doing a little bit of visceral massage to change how his organs can move because all of the organs will send massive amounts of sens sensory information up to the brain. Um, again, without going too much into the neurology, all of these can correlate to specific muscular tension patterns. So all of Jamie's muscular tension patterns where we saw like adductors, quads, um, obliques correlated to his intestines, his lower back, his QL, Again, intestinal issues. Do you remember I couldn't get under my rib cage to my liver the very first time? I thought, so I'm not going to tell people how to do this because it is quite out there. But anyway, I had to get through a certain bit of tissue to get to my liver and I actually couldn't. And I messaged Martin going, Martin, it's like, there's a balloon in the way. And he's like, no, that's just a buildup of tissue you need to work through. So I did it. I think it took three attempts, so three days straight. And then I was actually finally able to get through to the liver. That's how much was built up. So it's just a buildup of inflammation around the liver and how he hasn't hadn't been breathing correctly, hadn't been utilizing his diaphragm correctly. So we didn't get that natural movement of how our liver should move during respiration. His was just sort of stuck there. And that correlates to the shoulder issues he was getting as well. Wow. So, so then we Martin, just quickly, so just talking about your experience, and um, because yours was um kind of everything all in one go and <laughs> it obviously made you sick. But you know, so, sometimes when um, you accumulate stress. Um, you, you don't actually realise how bad you are. Um, you know, you, you're getting on with life, and you and you might not feel 100, percent but you don't you don't know the totality of the accumulation of stress. So, from the day before, how you were feeling compared to like a, a couple of days later, what was the difference in in how you felt from being generally just you beforehand to, to a, a couple of days later uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you know what prep sleeps like so I'd been waking up at 2 a.m every day um, just unable to sleep because of the prep um, just generally running off pretty high stress body was worn down fatigued just pretty broken um because this was like nine months or so after I near enough dislocated my hip as well so body was in a major site of stress and immediately after the treatment well not treatments I started getting a little bit tired which was the first sign of a detox reaction I fell asleep in the course for 10 minutes and then woke up feeling like I think I'm going to throw up ran outside ran to the toilets threw up which was just that toxic burden coming out of my system and then immediately after that I got this like sense of euphoria sense of lightness and just general like great feeling when I got back into the course I just started like moving a little bit better joints started feeling lighter and then I started sleeping the, after that like despite still being in like a reverse out of the prep diet my sleep improved all of like most of the niggles that I was having from the hip issue had started disappearing. So I wasn't getting the same daily pains that I had because of this ability of the fluids to move around my body more effectively. And just generally like a sense of well-being, feeling better, um, which is which is quite often one of the things we'll see with lymphatic treatments. You get this just general feeling of well-being, sense of euphoria after. Some people get a little tired, a little sleepy, which is a very mild detox reaction. So it's like monitoring those and utilizing it at a time of day, which suits you best. So if you're someone that gets that like energy from it, put it before a session, put it in the morning. If it's someone who brings you back down a little bit, like Jamie, put it before you go to bed and then you'll sleep deeper. So it's I, very- I do, I do it before a sauna and it really helps with a sauna, yeah. So, so I, don't, I don't know anybody listening that wouldn't want a bit of that, to be honest, myself included. And I probably, um, the amount of stress build up from, from my physical, um, you know, what's the word? Just what I do on a day by day basis and have done for years and years and years. I can imagine that I would benefit, you know, 100% from, from doing something like that. So I don't literally don't know anybody listening that wouldn't want to do that. Um, initially and then obviously repeat that so can obviously you're going to put some um, uh, posts up on Instagram you're going to refresh your feed and add them back in 
is that going to give them enough to be able to to apply these things themselves so yeah that will give the the first step into the system so I utilize a modified system from Stop Chasing Pain, as he, like I said, he's one of the people I've learned heavily from. So the first six phases, uh, sorry, first phase of this system, there's basically six points which Perry teaches. So these are the collarbone, as this is where it drains to, just um, at, just below the ear, sort of behind the jaw, the, the pecs, the abs, the groin behind the knee. So these are six like major areas and we just sort of tiptoe into the system with some brushing, some tapping, and that will stimulate the different receptors and start to stimulate flow from there. So that alone is a massive change for most people. And that's what gave me the Hertz reaction, by the way. So I I will obviously put a disclaimer out. If you have any like (laughs) major issues start slightly below this but this is generally the level that most people can start at um and go see your doctor yeah you left that 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 very important bit out of their mind but okay yeah so obviously if you've got any underlying health issues consult with your physician physician first uh yeah 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 Um, i I tried for years because it worked very well yeah um but understand on the same basis i've got clients who are specialist consultants and he he was brought over from europe as a specialist consultant for the nhs for over a year and i educated him into the lymphatic system nutrition and everything and he was like wow we had one day training on this not even that and I view it as one of the most important systems of the body. Yeah. So take that as take that as you will. That is not slander. It's, 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 it's the Cinderella system, isn't it? Doctor Perry says the Cinderella system because it's unappreciated and un, unutilized. Yeah. Yeah. Which is which is why I opened with saying it is the least utilized, most underappreciated, but also one of the most important systems of our body. Of all the presentations I'm building on my client portal at the moment, I'm putting the most effort into that. It's going to be about four presentations long. So that just shows the importance of this. Like gut health will only be one freaking presentation. Um, so that just puts it into perspective, right? Um, but for him, from there, so we've gone on to a lot of the science of what me and Martin were trying to do. I think it's important now to almost pull it back a bit and almost just give people the structure rather than always the science. So... In a nutshell, if Martin, if you want to cut me up, feel free to. Um, in a nutshell, we basically combined my years of experience battling mold, battling health, learning my own. Book. So basically, Martin gave me, he literally went to what foods sit well for you? I told him. What training have you done? I told him. What supplements have you always taken that you found help with my, I have an autoimmune disorder, which is NCAS, mass cell activation syndrome. So what doesn't trigger your histamine? What, what dampens your immune response? So we had all that. So pretty much we used all of that. And then Martin just added to it. So Martin pulled down my volume. We, I was already doing saunas. So we just added the lymphatics on top of that because I had an at-home one. He added in cardio because I'm a fat shit and I can't stand cardio. Uh, so that was twice a week. He then added in, so that's pulled down volume, adding that. Uh, we added in a few more supplements based on assisting uh, just detoxification after bloods. Um, but my SHPG was through the roof. So that means it would bind up natural testosterone, which wasn't great. So we had to like sting in nettle root, stuff like that to pull that down. And we basically ran it from there. And was there anything else I missed there, Martin? No, we just pulled out a few of the subs, which we didn't feel you needed, put in a few different ones. Yeah. Which, so yeah, um, the way we, we both approach things, we'll always be looking at subtracting before we start adding. Yes. So before I started adding anything, I looked at Jamie's very extensive list of supplements <laughs> and saw what we <laughs> He was, a, he, he was a walking pharmacy. Yeah. Joy, um, joys of mold, people. The joys of mold. So first we pulled out anything that we could, because there were a lot of things which had very similar effects. So yeah. we pulled out what was excess, put in a few different areas that we viewed as essential, introduced his lymphatic treatments on that scaled progressive basis, and just modified his training so he could not just like get stronger, but move better. So we've so far talked just about like um, his, how he making him move better, but obviously there's still this underlying aspect of Jamie is a bodybuilder, wants to compete. 
So we still had to get them stronger, still progress progressively overload the tissue. It was just a case of getting him into the positions where he could utilize his muscle better and actually target the tissue he wanted to grow rather than just driving compensatory patterns. And then alongside that, just a few specific foods that we introduced to support how his body absorbed and assimilated fats because he didn't digest fats very well. So we basically used radishes, um, artichokes, chicory rocket to help him utilize fat better. All of these also aiding benefits to histamine and mast cell activation syndrome. So he addressed things from that nutritional level. And then, yeah, because of his overall stress levels from like life, business, twins, and twins. Train <laughs> kids, uh, <laughs> and yeah. training, we looked at how much his body could handle, pulled his training volume right down. He was getting strong on absolutely everything. So then as the inflammatory load reduced, the stress levels reduced, we started reintroducing volume. And you have no idea how happy I was when I got a two set hat spot. <laughs> um, by the way, this was all tracked through an aura ring. So this wasn't us going, how are you feeling? This is accurate live data. Um, obviously me, Martin, Matt, uh, I don't think you've got one yet, have you, Tyler? Um, no, yeah, no. Um, so yeah, so we, this is all like accurate data tracks. So we're not just going, oh, Jamie's got stronger, so that means he can handle more load. This was HRV, heart rate, body temperature, stuff like that. So this is actual tracking of measure. Yeah, so this was a combination of the objective data from the aura ring um, and also on subjective data as well. So on Jamie's daily perception of how he was feeling on like a stress, energy, hunger, mood, libido, um, recovery, performance, motivation, like dietary adherence and everything. And then, yeah, like we said at the beginning, we pushed his food up at one point in the middle because the data suggested his thyroid levels were starting to drop by a drop in body temperature. So then yeah. we just gave him more food so his thyroid levels could come back up and he could continue to progress. To carry on from that, which is quite interesting. So that thyroid so, drop... Sorry, just before you carry on, can I just... Um, yeah, it, 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 what you're talking is, um, is interesting, particularly in the bodybuilding world, because as a bodybuilder... Uh, and I've done this for I've done it for decades, not just years, decades of you know going hard, basically nonstop. More is better. Train over training constantly, um, pulling calories out, and um, pushing cardio up. Um, you know, it, the the mentality is to go hard, and all that all that does at the end of the day is drive the stress. And I think um, Martin's key. Um, I think, I think the, the key thing or the key issue in this is stress. Um, the overarching thing that you wanted to reduce, and you he, he, he mentioned it a couple of times there, is reduction in stress. Bring the stress down. Um, using all the techniques Martin said is, is probably the, the, over, the, the main driver for this is reducing the stress to then um, be able to be not, you don't have to train as hard. You can get more out of less. You, you know, you can push your food back up. Um, and I think that's the, the key that as a bodybuilder, you lose sight of, um, the, the, I, I suppose, you, you, you're focused on a goal and you just want to keep driving. And my mentality is just to keep pushing and no Tyler's would be the same. She just go for it, sets a target and then goes for it no matter what. The, I'll have, I can deal with any hunger pains, any tiredness, um, whatever to get the job done. But actually what I learned over decades was I would have been a much better bodybuilder had I listened to my body, had I had someone like Martin, you know, saying your stress levels are through the roof, bring it down, you know, deload, de de um, take your weights down, take your volume down, push your food up, wh whatever the answer was, I would have become a better bodybuilder from, from listening to my body. Well, following on from that, so I woke up one morning and I was like, Martin, for some reason, this is the hardest day. Like I was, nothing would work. And again, the whole, what's the quote, prep brain, or it's the prep life, right? Now, looking at the O-ring data, my body temperature dropped 0 0.6, which was way over the threshold we wanted it to drop. So that means my thyroid was starting to tank. So that's your body telling you, if you carry on doing this, you're only going to tank your thyroid, which drives your metabolism, which basically drives your calorie output. So um, think about it from a calorie. If you want to go down just the calorie route, if we ignored that, 
you're making it harder to get leaner because you've actually told your body it's not safe to keep getting lean. So it's going to slow everything down. It's where it adapts, right? So we had, what, two days of building food up. And I, when I got ill, so it was really bad. Three days. Three, Three days. Day. Sorry. Three days of building food up. Um, and it actually was when I got ill. So it backfired a little bit. And again, if I push that even further, I could have got even more ill. So and this just shows, right? And then it was it two days in, my thyroid came straight back up. We continued it. It dropped calories back down or slightly higher this time. And then the, the weight loss just continued. Do you so see what I mean? Right in saying that, Jamie, when you went through the, the four weeks, your output, was actually pulled back so you were actually doing less than what you your previous um mine mine programming ten thousand steps a day and i only hit that three times i'm not even gonna lie like it's nothing that was nothing to do with dedication that was down to me being the excel freak i am i was designing a new spreadsheet and anyone that knows me i'm a very particular when i when i start something i'll literally dream about it i will just think about it if i have to do it and i was what i said to martin if i if this fucks me up that's on me so yeah i think i managed six seven thousand steps a day um, but Martin gave me 10 and yeah, other than that twice a week cardio, we pulled cardio out a week before. Um, yeah, we, we dropped cardio for the last week and I lost actually more weight when we did that. And this is what I'm trying to wake people up for, you know, and a lot of this came down to how my food sat. So when I got ill, uh, we've actually literally four days ago found out that I've now got stomach acid issues, which is really annoying because we knew that before it explains why a lot of foods were reacted, how they did. So I do genuinely believe we would have smashed way past 10 kilo if I knew this before. Um, but this is what we want to prove that this is matters, right? And another thing I wanted to add, which I nearly forgot, when we started the lymphatic work, people, so mold affects this as well as other issues. Um, and obviously I'm, I'm riddled with health issues. Well, I was at one point. Um, when I first done lymphatic drainage, I stunk of dead, rotting metal. And I had really bad breath because lymphatics obviously goes through the lungs. And my wife literally couldn't go near me for about, I would genuinely say, because I started lymphatics before the protocol started. So I'd say about a month. And it was only midpoint of the phase where that stopped. Like one feeder set on a hat squat, I was dripping with sweat and it stunk. And I had to change my clothes three times a day. And that is a sign that my body was so backed up with toxins. We finally opened up the, the door, so to speak, so those toxins can come out. And they're all dead from years of being there. So... And I stunk. The first time I did it, I dropped a kilo and a half. I'll never forget that. And like I said, it just shows how important this is. And I've never, ever, ever found it this easy to shift weight. Last year, when we did my, like, if anyone seen my transformation last year, that was 10 times more aggressive than what we did in four weeks. And Martin actually said we could end this with a photo shoot if we wanted to. And it was me that said no, because I'm sick of dieting. So I've done it fighting mold for so long. So I just want to build calories now, right? And that alone, that mindset of let's just get away with the bare minimum and prove what you can do if you just look after your body. That was the mindset we both had throughout. If I ever had a really stressful day, there was never Jamie suck it up. This is prep. That was never, ever. This is why I hired Martin because I didn't want to hire a bodybuilding coach. I wanted someone that could understand if I say, look, my body's struggling. It's actually fucking struggling. It's not a don't be a pussy mindset. It's actually there's an issue that we need to address first. Um, and yeah, we ran from that. And this is exactly what we did. And this is why this stuff's so important. And yeah, and we, we ran out to that point. And is there anything I've missed? And to be clear, we were on a 40% deficit. So before anyone thinks that I was on like a thousand calories a day, I was on 1800 to 1600 a day. Um, it wasn't even that low, you know, honestly, I wasn't even that hungry where I was dealing with inflammation and I wasn't walking that much because of my Excel sheets. So yeah, it really wasn't that hard. I'm not going to lie to you. It was more the restriction of foods because I'm so sensitive. And obviously my wife and that take, we went to Brighton and I couldn't eat because I was there having fish and chips. That was the hardest point of the whole thing was the fact that when I went to have fish and chips to my, my family on a pier, that was it. But now we're already coming out of that. Now that we've addressed more of these issues, well, the stomach acid thing we kind of lost sight of yeah because we were focused on mold <laughs> we, we, were, we were so focused on the mold and those those major underlying health issues that we lost sight of the sometimes simpler options but that wasn't apparent until we reduced the mold issues so yeah. now that we've addressed that foods are only going to sit better because his stomach will be in a more sterile um more sterile position so now rather than food coming in sitting there fermenting and driving this immune response this, the higher stomach acid levels are going to start to sterilize what's coming in so he'll be less prone to infection less prone to like pathogenic infections like bacteria h pylori um, the parasites any like fungal infections 
So we've already had like a major win for um, anyone who knows histamine. Pineapple is a bastard. And, it's the best fruit in the world, though. And yeah, Jamie, again, like he does, ignoring me. <laughs> Start with a little bit of pineapple. He goes and eats a whole pineapple. <laughs> Mate, but pineapple, no, but, but no uh, reaction. So it's like, yeah, I had a whole pineapple. It's Matt's fault because we had pineapple <laughs> and cinnamon when we went to freaking Liverpool, and I couldn't find cinnamon, but I found a pineapple. <laughs> so I was like, I'll just meet halfway here and have the whole pineapple. Um, just to let you know, I I had pineapple. Like, so this is just clarifying to anyone that doesn't have health issues. I can name five of my clients right now. One of them who is, I actually want to bring her on the podcast at a later date because of her health journey, which has been insane. We actually dealt with a parasite as well through similar methods. Um, anyone that has fructose issues and fructose intolerance, which basically means you don't deal with fruit very well. When you get fruit back in your life, you can't just have a well, half a pineapple. It has to be the whole fucking thing. And, uh, and I specifically remember coming out of prep last year and having half a pineapple and being bent over in pain. I actually remember that. So I had a whole pineapple when I dropped a kilo. For me, that is ridiculous. I that would have. I actually ate that thinking I'd probably gain half a kilo, but I really want a pineapple. And I mean, yeah. And if you go into a Brazilian restaurant, then it's difficult not to uh, eat the pineapple. So, but yeah, there you go. We're, we're coming up to the hour now, so I did say we want to try and finish on the hour. So I just want to give Martin the opportunity to. to is there any information there? that you've missed off that you want to finish with. I've got a couple of questions for you myself um, that I want to try and cover. Um, but is there anything that you want to finish with, Martin, yourself? Uh, I was just going to bring it back to what you said about um, bodybuilders and the approach. So it's like, as a bodybuilder myself, I early on got caught in that mindset of just being overly aggressive with everything, pushing food up as high as possible because I was always a skinny kid and not addressing the underlying health issues. So at the highest point, I was having to put away just under 8,000 calories a day to maintain weight. Um, then that was because of a parasite, right? Because she wasn't actually digesting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I, um, I had candida and a parasite. Mm. Um, so I had candida because I was on IV antibiotics. And I had a parasite from a previous food infect, food, um, what's the word? Poisoning. <laughs> That's the word, food poisoning issue. Um, so that had been there for about three years, three, four years. And then when I started addressing the underlying health issues, or yeah, I initially dropped like 18 kilos, some of which was normal weight, about nine kilos. And that was probably inflammation. And now I'm maintaining my food, well, maintaining current weight on sub 4,000 calories and able to start growing again on like four and a half compared to the, like the seven and a half, eight it took before, which just drove inflammation. So it's it's very much addressing the underlying health aspects, not as a way of getting out of training hard, but as a way of being able to train harder, smarter. Yeah, so That's the point, isn't it? It's, it's, like, there's no excuse for not training hard enough. It's just recognizing that how, how do you train as hard as you can um, and get the maximum amount from that without um, you know risking your health or, or even going backwards in your training exactly so it's, uh, i very much look at everything as like a minimally effective dose so how can we get the absolute most stimulus out of the absolute least so whether that be supplements whether that be food whether that be training volume so how can if we're dieting how can we diet on the most food if we're growing how can we grow on the least food just to minimize overall stresses how can we grow on the absolute minimal training volume? Well, we're, so we, we're reverse dieting out right now. And I've complained twice that I'm like, these sessions still don't trash me. They trash me neurologically, but I'm still like, I still don't have three sets. I have one exercise that's three sets. and I really look forward to it. But even, even now we're building food up. My weight's still coming down. Yeah, it's still coming down, people. And, um, and strength's going through the roof. And I'm waiting for more volume. But again, it's that approach of, if that's a good place to be in if you're getting ridiculously stronger each week and and you're not even you're, you can definitely do more my aura is telling us we can do more as well and again it's just it's just waiting and buying your time you don't have to kill yourself you know so with jamie as there's still that h pylori and uh, that's that, a stuff do you want to break down h pylori do you want me to do it really quickly yeah, you, you, like. you can go through it <laughs> you, you, you run through it quickly 
basically it's a bacteria that lives in your stomach lining anyone that's had h pylori will know that this can lead to stomach ulcers so when matt said about grinding really hard a few years ago of a previous mentor i won't say his name because it wasn't his fault we pushed it too far we were 1500 calories a day did the whole hours cardio a day did the old suck out just get on with it and it basically ate away my stomach lining and it led to stomach ulcers and it got to a point where i actually could have had some serious health i don't use the word die but it actually could have got that bad because my stomach was on the verge of bursting because how bad it was um because i was on black coffee and yehimbine which black coffee really does stimulate stomach lining and it was basically ripped apart by h pylori so lovely so h pylori lives in there well, i was i was over with overgrowth then we dealt with it and we thought we did back then but one of the h pylori's biggest things is that actually reduces stomach acid so it can live in your stomach so this is why we think stomach acid is now low now and it can cause a lot of bloat like immediate responses to when food hits your stomach like literally after swallowing it causes bloating and then can lead to more fermentable issues later on because it hasn't sterilized the food because of a low stomach acid. So all this then comes as a part of that. So although it doesn't cause intolerances directly, it causes them later on because it creates an environment where then those negative bacteria that causes the intolerances can then thrive. Hopefully that makes sense. But yeah, bear in mind. Sorry, buddy. So basically because of that, because we've still got that <laughs> underlying stressor in the stomach where holding training volume at where it's at because Jamie's strength is going through the roof on a session by session basis and his nervous system can't handle more stress this goes for anyone who's in like a high stress environment it will wear away at um, connective tissue at stomach lining so like marathon runners people in prep doing hours of cardio people doing massively high training volume it drives like a sympathetically uh, driven system so fight or flight or if you're also in a specific immune type that can drive this same breakdown of collagen collagen being the primary um, protein in tendons in your stomach lining so it can start to break those down so we're just holding it there until the stomach's in a better place where we can push things harder again without having that negative stress response basically imagine when i'm healthy what we can so, do. Yeah, so it, it's just basically looking at Jamie's stress as a glass of water and making sure it's pushed high enough towards the top that it drives an appropriate stimulus for growth, but not tipping it over the edge. Mm-hmm. And Make then sure as, as, these things. as we reduce it from one area, we can push it up a little more from another. It's probably the easiest way to look at it. I think me introducing pineapple back into my life dropped my, my stress cup by at least half. So <laughs> I've had, I've got a shot glass of stress at the moment. Um, <laughs> you have no idea. Every four days I buy a pineapple now, it's making my life. Um, <laughs> yeah. To be fair, it's ripped off on me. I've got pineapple in my fridge now, which is... Oh, the- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm on the pineapple train, guys. <laughs> so um, I-, I have got... Um, two questions for you, Martin. Um, hopefully, they won't take forever to answer, but um, <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do my best. So, the, the first question is, is a scenario based question, is, and it's quite typical, or where, whereby, say, for instance, a, a client or a person dieting um, gets to a point where, you know, and but this is just calorie controlled because they haven't introduced lymphatic drainage and things like this. Um, they haven't looked at reducing st- stress levels and all these other factors. They're just focusing on output, increasing output and, and reducing calories effectively. Uh, but what happens is you get to this um, plateau of weight loss. And then what happens is they drive the cardio up and reduce the calories. But that doesn't necessarily always continue to drive a fat loss. So what advice would you give to people in, in that scenario would looking at lymphatic drainage help analyzing bloods? Um, you know, I don't know what, what advice would you give to people in that scenario? Cause it's quite common. I, I usually do the opposite, reduce training, reduce cardio, increase food yeah. to reduce the overall stress on the body, give it a chance to recover, stimulate thyroid again, and basically give, give the body two, three days to replenish, recover. So it can go again harder. Um, to, like, for women, this needs to be done more often. So if we're doing any like aggressive fat loss protocols for women, I would generally do like five days on, two days off. So five days pushing it hard, two days of back at maintenance calories so they can get those thyroid hormones back because their body doesn't want to lose weight. It you wants keep their to be, cycle in regulation as exactly, well. Keep cycle regulated. Body doesn't want to lose weight as effectively so it's still able to bear a child. 
So we need to look at it from the hormonal perspective. Blokes, we can go a little longer, but it's again, if you've got the option to look at that data and have something like an aura ring, see if your morning body temperature is coming down. If not, you can just like look at it from a, are you chronically fatigued? Has weight loss stalled? Are you starting to get more inflamed? Is your training performance suffering? If, if you tick all of those boxes, it's probably best to pull it back for like two days or so. Increase food a little bit, drop training stress a little bit, and then you'll be fresher and able to go again. Another thing to note as well, before you'd even start a dieting phase, in my opinion, mine hopefully would agree, I'm sure you will, is before you even start one of these phases, you need to identify your stressors because then you can manipulate them. And not only by, and I don't just mean your partner's a dickhead at times, it could lead, or bills a prick at work. It could be so much more than that. It could be how foods digest. Do you have health issues? Are you, do you hold inflammation already, which is way more than just fat storage? Because if you do have food intolerances and you're dieting with those intolerances, a healthy, nourished body burns fat and builds muscle 10 times easier than an unhealthy one. We just basically proved that. And the idea of this is if you're not aware of these things, obviously I wouldn't suggest doing it mid prep because you're putting stress yourself out further trying to find them, but it's why you want to find them first. So just make the process easier because if you're having a food that is inflammatory feet, there's no such thing as an inflammatory food. It's how it responds to you. So if you have an inflammatory response to gluten, it can be so many things. It's not just gluten that can be the issue, but if you have leaky gut, that will make it worse. If you have mold, that will make it worse. So for me in this prep, if I was to go, Martin, I don't care, I'm going to have a bagel every day, that would have been the most idiotic thing to do because you're going to create a, a, a higher stress load purely from that one food because it's not serving me. And it's more than just, there's, how, there's a balance how, to this. How does someone um, identify? Um, a food intolerance. Yeah, an intolerance to a certain food or? Um, for me, um, I, intolerance tests, please do not waste your money. Um, they actually lead you on a rabbit hole you'll never get out of and they can cause a lot of, uh, you're expensive as hell as well for what they actually do. Personally, um, I go by looking at the individual, seeing the symptoms they present, looking at their photos. So if someone, if I, if I get them pinching certain sites and they're, they're inflamed, doing it again where you can't see people, uh, but you pinch certain sites, if they're, if they're like really tender and puffy, like watery, feet like muffin top lower back kind of thing, which is basically why I had Martin pointed out, dick, um, then that's not going to be your calories. That was because I was having a freaking donut with my kid the day before. And it's one of those things where you almost have to be an adult and sit there and go, well, you're eating like a child and your body's not going to deal with it. And there is a, like, there's this thing in this bodybuilding world that strict diets work and like the whole white fish thing back in the day. Right. Although that is ridiculous. There is also a reason why that works so well is because most people digest fish. Okay. Cause it doesn't cause digestive upset. It's not the fish gets you lean. It's just, that it digests really easily. And for me, it's identifying foods by, you could pull right back and pull right back on foods, start really basic and simple, but it's such a complex thing. And this isn't me trying to sell it or anything like that, because mine would be just as efficient as I would be, but it's identifying for you. So if you have bloods done and you had monocytes through the roof and basophils through the roof, you're going to have a very restrictive diet because that will trigger histamine and that will trigger an inflammatory response. Whereas if you had a blood test done and there was just, think of saying basic mind help me there was just high ferritin that just means you've possibly got an inflammatory load we could just probably mean let's have some curcumin and let's just pull back a bit so it all depends on the individual and if they're chronically inflamed then you can look at them and they're 70 kilo but their structure should be 60 and they're not actually that fat they just look swollen you probably would just pull back and cover all bases in at the start anyway to get that initial response where they drop three kilos in a week so does that help or not really the one thing i'd say there is obviously like blood tests get expensive so they're about yeah. 200 quid and then you have to have someone like myself or jamie it. to analyze it which again incurs extra cost the simplest way for like people at home to assess for an intolerance is having a combination of a food diary and yeah. tracking that and seeing what creates an inflammatory load but that can still have yeah. a bit of, bit of flux because inflammatory markers could stay present for 90 days. So yeah. whatever we eat could just be an accumulation of load from something else within that 90 days. Yeah, yeah. But my favorite method would be if you think it's going to be something that's going to induce uh, a response, check your pulse for 10 seconds, hold it in your mouth for a few seconds, recheck your pulse. If it's gone up, that's an immune-based reaction. So that is going to be to that specific stimulus that you've put in your mouth and it's a 
cheap and easy free way to assess for your own intolerance yeah. that you can do without needing to hire a specialist. I would love to say I did that before the pineapple the other day. I didn't. It was you in did. my mouth. And of I course you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. So thanks for the- Sorry, uh, what, what other symptoms could people look out for if they were suffering from like intolerances what would be kind of a, a key marker that people can look out for and be like hey you know what actually this is maybe causing something would it be like bloating or um so there's a lot of things in this industry that people normalize and this winds me the hell up like these prep dickheads i'm going to call you dickheads because you are that say oh i've got the prep bloat or i've got that i'm a bloat on this so like they're trying to justify bloating you're making it okay for people that do suffer with bloating to say that's okay. It's not normal and it's not okay. Like if you, ble- if you, if a female pre- um, bloats on a cycle, that is very different. You having a muffin bloating and trying to get a justification, like the whole cheat meal thing again, right? Don't set me off. So there is no, there isn't any symptom that's actually quote unquote optimal. They are just classed as normal. Look at IBS, one of the most normal symptoms in the world. And it's just a sign that there's something wrong, but and, and it's a very, unfortunately that's a very hard question to answer because I've had someone that had a reaction and I'm not even joking you, this can become, this can make people very paranoid. So be very careful with this. I had someone once that can, oh, what did she consume? It was something like a bit of sweet potato, which can be a higher FODMAP food in large amounts. And she bloated through the roof. And I was like, nah, I'm not convinced of sweet potato. She was convinced. And then we went through her food log, like Martin said, it was not, it was the bagel she had three days ago. It just happened to digest at that point. You need to remember when you eat food, it doesn't just come out your ass the next hour. It can take four or five, even longer, depending on your digestive health. So it's actually that hit her large intestine and caused a reaction then because we tried sweet potato two weeks later and it's absolutely fine. So you have to be very careful that if you have an immediate response, it could be the straw that broke the camel's back rather than the root cause that you had four days ago. So just be very, this is why you have to, unfortunately, looking at this from a, on, a, on a lens, you have to find someone that can help, that actually understands it and won't judge you. It's, it's highly individualized but yeah if so one of the key things i look out for for stomach issues is do we have like breakouts on the skin so skin issues anywhere um or skin issues on the face so skin issues anywhere skin issues on the face will be more stomach skin issues anywhere else will be more intestines so if that if that's there we already know there's a gut issue what gut issue we need to dig a little deeper but if you're having issues on your skin that's already pretty much a huge indicator that there is something going on in the gut it's a huge organ right the the skin is a basically a continuation of the gastrointestinal system from that embryological layer that i spoke about earlier so it's all ectodermal tissue it all derives from the same same source so gut and skin is linked and also when we look at those detoxification pathways skin being a major one if you don't poo pee effectively if you can't breathe properly if your liver's overburdened if your lymphatics is overburdened which all five of those most people they pee too frequently and they break out on their skin because they're the detox systems that they can utilize they don't utilize their lymphatics they don't poo two or three times a day which is normal it shouldn't be less than that. Um, they don't breathe effectively because they're stuck in certain movement patterns and their liver's overburdened because of all the like toxins in day-to-day life. So we need to support those other systems. The skin issues go away. So, and it's, it's not a pill that, uh, that can be prescribed either, people. That will fix that. Well, we Lifestyle. Should, we should mm. go to the doctors and um, get prescribed some steroid cream to fix skin issues. But anyway. Um... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, okay, so I've got the next question. I know we're getting one and over, but I want to... <laughs> we will keep this to an hour. To, <laughs> like that SpongeBob voice, two hours later. <laughs> Does you keep talking? Hey! <laughs> right, so I'm, I am joking. Um, I Martin, um, you mentioned before about um, um, bodybuilder um, patterns of movement and you know sticking to the same patterns of movement, shortening ranges of movement, etc. So... Um, if you've got a bodybuilder that did, for instance, work in the short, mid and, and longer um, ranges of movement, would you still recommend that they added in functional movements on top of that? Would it, would it be good to do some type of functional training on, on top of bodybuilding 
to, to get that additional kind of not not just because obviously a, a bodybuilder using a machine or even a free weight if you're doing a um, a dumbbell bicep curl that 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 um, movement is still in the same plane but if you go to I don't know functionally pick up a um, a slam ball say for instance um, put it above your head and slam it on the floor you, you're moving those joints in a different um, along a different axis you're using the shoulder joints in different axes and movements is that something that you would recommend but I it bloody hope not mine. <laughs> I so fucking hope not. It depends on the context of the individual and the situation. If there's injuries, I would get them moving in different ways. If it's someone like Jamie who doesn't have a specific injury, I'd just look at the movements that they're deficient in and program some ways that they can start to utilize some more functional patterns, but still under load. So it's not a way like you look at some of the functional training bullshit and it's just nonsense. It's basically just going completely away from someone's goals and getting them to do arbitrary nonsense. Yeah. Um, we've got to make that relevant to the individual. So if it's a bodybuilder, functional is going to be very different to what is functional for like a tennis player or a footballer. So we've got to make it functional for the individual while still correcting their, their issues. So for Jamie now, it, we're doing like offset split squats because he's always been like tight glutes, knees flared out, pelvis dumped forwards and li limited in every range of possible hip movement because of his previous presentation. So we needed to find him some adductors. So we're doing some basic like split squats, but addressing like rotational movement. So he shifts into one hip more. And then we're using offset loading to stimulate a specific response and i could go into it more we basically base that off specific phases of the gait cycle because that's how a lot of our neurological responses work off um, but from from the most basic level it's looking at what he can and cannot do what areas he cannot get into and then applying a dose specific stimulus for him that gets him into that movement pattern while still also being able to build muscle so yeah He's it's a meathead it, it started off lower intensity just because that's where he was at but so we we had a little bit more volume on those just so he could learn learn a pattern because we need that repetition to learn and then when he could start loading we dropped the stress down a little bit and fed load so now those movements they're still like rehabilitative focused but they're going to drive a stimulus for growth as well so it's like if we take jamie from like not being able to front for elevated split squat his body weight to then having 80 kilos on his back 100 kilos on his back he's going to grow some massive adductors quads and hamstrings mm -hmm. and it's also going to teach that hip to rotate in inwards so he's going to have that hip shift be able to access different phases of gait that will allow his pelvis to move better throughout a normal squat rather than just compressing him further, which is what he was doing before. Okay, so, so is, there, is there an overarching advice that you could give people <sighs> starting in bodybuilding to, to, to apply on top of the bodybuilding? You know, is, is the, should they be changing their exercises? Um, I, I, is, is, is there a tip or advice that you could give to people? Because my, I'm talking from experience because for 30 years I've been working through the same um, planes of motion, the same ranges of movement. And I've become very, very stiff. I, you know, literally, if, if they put me on them um, dancing on ice, I'd literally look like the tin man. I wouldn't be able to move. Um, but I'm pretty capable of lifting heavy weights up above my head, you know, and doing it in a, in a gym environment. But if, again, if you put me on a building site, I probably wouldn't be able to do half the things um, that someone could do. So what's so your overarching advice? The sport needs specificity, so we need to still drive that same response, but we also need to, at appropriate moments in time, address the issues that that sport leaves. So every sport will leave issues because of how we're moving, and we just want to address those in a way that don't interfere with the sport. So for bodybuilders, it's look at how you look at the areas that you're struggling in physique development that's going to give a clue as to the areas you can't move. Like if you don't have a long head of the bicep, 
we know we need to improve your ability to externally rotate this externally rotate the shoulder and to upwardly rotate the shoulder blades so we need to put you into positions that do that and then it's just going to be a specific movement that drives that response you just say that i've not got a long head bicep because you did that exactly to me you dick (laughs) yeah yeah fuck (laughs) i've got crucifix curls now it's making sense (laughs) yeah so for like a bodybuilder a crucifix curl is ticking those boxes It might not be a functional movement, but it's a functional movement for a bodybuilder because it puts your scapula in the proper position, teaches you to externally rotate and drives the function of the shoulder rather than just the actions. And muscles will have functions and actions. Bodybuilders typically drive the action. So we think, oh, yeah, bicep, elbow flexion, but it also depresses the humerus in the shoulder. So if we can also stimulate that secondary response or that action of depressing the humerus, will increase stability at the shoulder, then we can drive that response through the long head of the bicep. So using a movement like a crucifix curl does exactly that while still being able to train hard. Uh, so it's, it's blending that. So figure out what you can and cannot do. The things that you cannot do, you're going to need to address your training, which t- takes either some education in, into how the body moves or like working with working with someone who's got a higher like a higher education background into like biomechanics and then looking at progressively loading that over time so on the simplest level work out what you can't do so it might be like oh i don't have internal rotation how can i drive internal rotation that feeds into the whole body so like internal rotation on my hip how can i drive that and then utilizing a movement that you can still progress over time So ultimately that is bodybuilding, progressing a movement over time to induce a stimulus into a muscle. It doesn't always have to be a squat, a hack squat, a bench press. Find what stimulates your target tissue the best and drive that with progressive loading. It might not even have to be a fully functional exercise. Like corrective exercise is just exercising correctly. So we could do that, like could go into respiratory mechanics and all of that stuff, but scapular mechanics as well but ultimately like we can get the same response through doing a pull down properly and just knowing how to orient the rib cage how to allow the scapula to move rather than fixing things into place and just driving it from a singular plane so allowing things to move how they're intended to move alongside obviously doing our like maximal loading work so it's that that blend of letting things move and teaching movement in a specific context and in a specific context for a bodybuilder, that's not going to be like slam balls and jumping around and all of that. It's, it's not, it's not relevant, um, but it's going to be moving in patterns that we can load. So front foot elevated split squats, it's going to help with that hip shift, driving a bit of rotation around the pelvis, doing like crucifix curls, basically doing things outside of the sagittal plane that we can still load progressively over time. Yeah. Okay. So, so this has been brilliant. This podcast really has, because uh, I mean, especially from, we mentioned bodybuilding again, a few times from a bodybuilding perspective, we mentioned about removing stress um, looking, looking at, um, you know, re- re- reducing the load and, f- and increasing food and all the opposites to, to what a bodybuilder might do. And then we've just covered um, from a, a bodybuilding perspective the, the mechanical side of, of addressing weaknesses in the physique. Um, so, so from that aspect, I think this podcast has been, any, any bodybuilders listening to this will be going away and going, you know, okay, so I took, took a lot of le- um, lessons away there. So, it's also important to know that bodybuilding, like everyone sees bodybuilding as a person turned up on stage. Anyone that is trying to improve how their body looks is technically a bodybuilder. So when people hear that phrase bodybuilding, they think, oh, extreme end. But if you're someone that's trying to get in shape for a wedding or a holiday, you're technically bodybuilding because yeah. it's still an event. So don't straight away switch off and think, oh, it doesn't relate to me because I said the word bodybuilder. That's not true. Um, it, it definitely can. Exactly. Just to clarify on, on that, um, you know, every single person, every single client that I've got, you know, the majority of them do want to fat loss, but the secondary um, 
is always it's fat loss and muscle tone or grow muscle. So every single one of my clients and majority of clients are building a body, the, the growing muscle, um, the changing the composition, and um, reducing body fat. So but everybody who is lifting a resistance weight is effectively bodybuilding. Um, so yeah, physique building, physique changing, whatever words you want to use. So yeah, definitely a good shout there. Jamie. Yes. So that's good to clarify. Yeah. So from that context, if they are not competition bodybuilders, where obviously the loading is the pure pure stimulus, if they're like general population, we can we can utilize other functional movements because they're still train them more like an athlete than a stage bodybuilder so because then we're not going to create so many of these deficiencies in movement that like you or i might get because we've got that very specific task that we need whereas at like a general population it's they're not going to need as much muscle mass so we can still drive their relevant amounts of muscle mass through training them more like an athlete but just progressively overloading that on time. So it might be implementing some jumps or some slam balls from time to time to get them moving in different aspects. So they can, so they can get that still get their shoulder overhead. So they can still like rotate. So they can and still stimulate lymphatics as well. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's um, wrap that up. Um, I want to thank you, Martin, um, really, because that was um, like, like obviously the, the conversation before blew my mind. And, um, but this, this, going into this detail it's definitely educated me um, and I love to learn so thank you appreciate you coming on to the podcast no no worries at all thanks for having me on we appreciate it as well I think um, a message that you've you've really um, given across here is the importance of knowing what's going on inside your body to be able to actually perform and, and be the best that, that you can be and it's just such an important aspect that's often overlooked almost it's kind of pushed to the bottom of the pile when actually you know that's the foundation that that we're really grown from so yeah i've really enjoyed it as well yeah, brilliant yeah and you've exactly nailed it there like health is the foundation for any result we want to come after if you get that right everything else becomes easier well i, I think it's important to note as well as martin is my coach and obviously i've hired martin he's like my eighth coach because i get around but, and we've mentioned this on previous podcasts as well, the three of us are very capable coaches. We know we've coached clients. Like, I, like for example, Martin's ripped apart my anatomy and what I was doing wrong, right? If anyone watches my training stories, you see me of the cuffs, you see me of the resistance profiles. I know my shit when it comes to that. However, you can always learn more. So Martin's just used the cuff pull down as a good example of mine because you've ripped that apart. So I put a cuff on my elbow and I do a pull down. Everyone sees me do that on my Instagram stories. Yet I know Martin noticed that when I go up into the length and range, you can't see me bollocks but my basically I, I i elevated and i allowed external rotation of the shoulder so i allowed the elbow to flare at the top thinking i was getting a better length and range because i was taught that in the past where martin was like no you're actually not sorry internal rotation is that you're actually not your um i saw Martin about to correct me then you bastard um <laughs> and he was like you're actually not because that's you bypass the lat then and you're actually causing internal pressure of the shoulder so he was like just pull it back and do it that in a shorter range I think the first time I did that, my lats cramped up. Now, anyone that knows, if you get a cramping sensation like that, you've hit a new range that you've not hit before, and that's pretty much what's led to that. So that's one example there that we are very clued up coaches, but it shows you can always learn more. And this is one thing that I genuinely believe if you're someone that's on any fitness journey, whether you want to be a bodybuilder or you're someone that's doing it, go hire a bloody coach. Like if you're trying to do these things, just, just do it, whether it's mine, whether it's us, whether it's anyone um, I think that's a massive point because I pride myself on the knowledge I have, but there's always more to learn. Hence why I'm in the Institute. Hence why I've hired Martin. Hence why I speak to Jake and Brendan very commonly as well. Like Martin's one of many mentors. So I think it's very important to get your circle of education very tight and very reliable. And we go from here. So hence, that's why it's at that. Isn't it? Hence why we've got the podcast. Exactly Martin. that. Um, so Martin, what, what is your... I know we're going to put it on the um, information, but for people listening in the car or not able to, to look at the information, what is your Instagram handle? So it is just MF Performance Coaching. And if anyone wants to go on the website, it's again, just mfperformancecoaching.co.uk. Wicked, thank you. Um, so guys, um, that's a day, a wrap. And um, what are we going to cover for next week? Do we know? 
Have we decided? Uh, I'm probably going to do a question box because we have another guest. We have Sophie coming on at one point and we have one of um, Matt's friends coming on and I think we have someone else as well. Um, mm-hmm. There's a few guests in the pipeline, but we're probably going to keep them, what, every other week, every few weeks at least. Um, but I think next week, was, was it going to be question-based or is it something specific? I don't know. Should we go on a subject? What do we think? What would be a subject of interest? Well, should we ask the, the listeners because um, today's... Um, topic might actually drive some some yeah. questions and and topics so so listeners please um let us know what you want us to talk about on next week's podcast yeah, yeah please do okay thanks for listening guys um and tune in next week cheers guys thank you bye